Bonjour et bienvenue au séminaire d'Uranos d'aujourd'hui. J'aurais vraiment aimé d'être dans la salle aujourd'hui, mais il y a un petit bébé de virus qui s'est installé. Uh, good morning, everyone online. Um, I'll do a quick introduction in French and then switch back to English. Uh, alors, uh, pour les gens en ligne, merci de vous avoir connecté uh, pour nos deux présentations au sujet de la résilience du secteur énergétique. Face au changement climatique aujourd'hui, ces séminaires sont en fait font une suite à un séminaire qui a eu lieu il y a environ 15 mois où des experts de Manitoba Hydro et Ontario Power Generation parlaient de leurs approches aux résilience climatique et il y a des enregistrements qui sont disponibles sur notre site web. Euh, nos présentateurs d'aujourd'hui viennent tous de Québec mais ils ont généreusement accepté de présenter en anglais afin de permettre que nos membres et collègues anglophones du secteur de l'énergie euh, peuvent bien participer un peu dans l'échange mutuel. Euh, donc, euh, la présentation, les présentations euh, vont être en anglais. Je vais changer de plutôt euh, faire la modération en anglais aussi. Par contre, vous pouvez poser vos questions en français ou les taper dans le chat, dans le chat et euh, je tiens à vous rappeler que euh, vous devriez, s'il vous plaît, fermer vos caméras et vos micros pendant les présentations. So, to continue in English, hello and welcome uh, to today's Urano seminar on energy sector resilience to climate change. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for two presentations from our colleagues from Rio Tinto and Hydro Quebec. And this seminar is a follow-up to one that we held about 15 months ago, where experts from Manitoba Hydro and Ontario Power Generation presented their approaches to building climate resilience. And if you missed those, the recordings are available on Urana's website. Our presenters today are all from Quebec, but they have generously agreed to present in English to allow our English-speaking members and colleagues um, in the energy sector to participate. Um, my name is Marco Braun and I work in the Climate Scenarios and Services Group at Uranos, where I'm mostly involved in projects around issues of climate change impacts and adaptation of our energy business members. Um, I've had the pleasure to working closely with uh, many of our presenters, so it's my honor to moderate today's event. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in French or English or type them in the chat. And finally, let me remind you to please close your cameras and microphones during the presentations. So without further ado, um, let's move on to our first presentation, which is about the integration of climate change at Rio Tinto Quebec Power Operations. And I'll go ahead and introduce uh, our three presenters who are going to share different topics of this um, presentation. Um, and the first presenter is Jean Paquin, who is a senior civil engineer for, for the technical services Rio Tinto Aluminum. He has been involved in operational water management since 2001 for RTA assets in Quebec and in British, British Columbia. And he's now the principal advisor for the hydro hydrology team. Jean is mostly involved in inflow forecasts, energy planning, and long and short-term optimization. Jean also contributes to various R&D projects, especially in the commissioning of new models. He obtained a master's degree in applied sciences from the University of Sherbrooke in 2000. The second presenter is Marco Latravas, who is a researcher for the technical services of Rio Tinto Aluminum and he obtained a PhD in water sciences at ENRS University in Quebec with a specialization in statistical hydrology um, in 2000. I can try to speak louder, yes. Um, thank you. Um, Marco, before joining 2000, uh, Before, before joining Rio Tinto in 2008, uh, Marco worked uh, for Hydro Quebec from 2000 to 2008, where he was mainly involved in the modeling of inflows as inputs for stochastic optimization models. At Rio Tinto, he works on uncertainty modeling of meteorological and hydrological data. 
And uh, the third presenter is Gabrielle Dallar. She is a water resources analyst for the technical services of Rio Tinto Aluminum. She obtained a master's degree in applied sciences from the Ecole de Technologie Supérieure in 2019. And she has been a member of the water resources team of Rio Tinto for two years. Gabrielle uh, is currently involved in the operational water management of the Lac Saint-Jean and in various projects such as the integration of climate change into management tools. So um, over there in uh, the room in Sal A, can you remove me from the screen and bring up uh, the presentations? Uh, and I'll hand over to Jean, Marco and Gabriel. Pleasure is mine, the floor is yours. Is the, the sound okay uh, on the on the, in, on the Zoom? Yes. So it's a it's a real pleasure for me to uh, present uh, this morning uh, integration of climate change in Rio uh, Tinto operation. Uh, first of all, uh, who we are? Uh, we are a small team, nine people. Our name is uh, GRH for Group Resource Hydrique, and we are managing uh, water and energy for uh, Rio Tinto Hydro Power System in Canada. Uh, as uh, Bruno mentioned, our presentation will be in three parts. I will do a little bit of context, and my colleague Marco will discuss more technical details, <laughs> and Gabriel will give some results and example of uh, our, our adaptation or different tools we use. <laughs> Rio Tinto is a metal and mining corporation. It has its own uh, climate change team, and this team uh, operates mainly in four uh, fields. The first one is a uh, decarbonization project uh, to, uh, in order to achieve the carbon reduction targets. Uh, the second one is Cove 3 emission, is all the measurement related to uh, all the value chain, chain uh, from supplier to customers. And the third one is uh, what we call cap and trade, uh, where around the world we follow the uh, our obligation and the, uh, the exchange on carbon uh, markets. And the fourth one, which is adaptation, in which we are uh, sometime uh, involved, is related to risk assessment for the uh, to measure the asset vulnerability and resilience. And this uh, fourth uh, uh, group of the climate change team uh, had uh, lots of needs for climate variable and projection. Uh, there is more than 300 uh, location uh, of Rio Tinto across the globe. And most of it are quite small area. For example, this uh, tailing pound in uh, uh, To do those risk assessment, Piotinto developed his uh, own uh, climate change projection dashboard uh, in which we can obtain a report for uh, more than 60 uh, climate variable uh, in order to do those risk assessment and also to assist design of some uh, infrastructure and to support uh, modeling. The, the number behind this, uh, this dashboard is uh, provided uh, by a data service provider uh, based in New Zealand uh, called uh, Clean Systems, and their tool to generate the, uh, the report and to do the uh, data analysis is in uh, Climate Insight based on most recent uh, synopsis uh, climate uh, scenario. This group uh, provides guidelines for risk assessment and, as I mentioned, data for small catchment. Uh, the, uh, the GRH team, the, the small team in Saguenay, we can see as a mini hydro Quebec inside the Rio Tinto. Uh, we, we have complementary needs. We need more climate change development specific for 
energy system uh, because we our operation is on a large scale uh, catchment. Uh, also, we have a, uh, our day-to-day -day, uh, raw material to, to do the water management is our uh, quite long historical data set of uh, meteo. And also compared to uh, the, the, this, uh, this group in San Jacinto, uh, doing a risk assessment for a particular time horizon, uh, we, we have to operate and uh, on a daily basis, uh, reservoir management is, is, is continuous. Talking about our, our huge uh, catchment, uh, there's one in the Saint Alexandra region, and we operate another one in Northern BC, the Nechaco uh, watershed. Uh, our uh, power plant, we have uh, more than 4,000 uh, megawatt of installed capacity, and on a yearly average, we generate almost uh, three quarter of the installed capacity. The the, the result of today will be more focused on the uh, Lac Saint-Jean watershed, which is a quite huge watershed, uh, uh, 74,000 uh, square kilometer. And it has a significant uh, gradient from now to site of more than 500 uh, kilometers. Uh, on this watershed, the power plant, uh, we, we, we generate uh, power along the Péribanca River and on the Saguenay River. There is three main reservoir, six power plant and 44 generator. Uh, the, the famous Lac Saint-Jean is also uh, the name of the, the region. So I, I don't really have to mention that our operation is at the heart of communities. There is more than 10,000 uh, shoreline residents uh, we operate uh, under a, a decree. And uh, in fact, we, we think we have three gauges to, uh, to measure the Lac Saint-Jean level, but in fact, there is many hundred, uh, every, uh, and almost everyone uh, has its own uh, mark uh, to, uh, there's a close follow-up of our management uh, from the, uh, the stakeholder and the, the, the communities surrounding the list. The energy generated by Rio Tinto uh, is used for the, uh, the aluminum uh, transformation. Uh, almost 90% uh, of the smelter lead needs are fulfilled by uh, the Lac Saint-Jean energy, and the other 10% is provided by uh, energy hydro Quebec. This is a uh, a little bit, a, a timeline, a little bit of our history versus uh, climate change. Uh, it started uh, in 2004 with a bit of what I call a curiosity. Uh, we saw this, uh, this graph uh, presented by René Roy in 2004, showing an increase of uh, runoff. And it was for uh, into, uh, an awareness that climate change can have a significant impact on our uh, territories. And, uh, after the year after, we, uh, our question was how it could affect us. We conduct a vulnerability exercise with fundamental question that uh, is it for what, uh, for when, uh, what is the number? And we realized that we needed to, to know more. And uh, so in, during that time, we, uh, we participate uh, with workshop, uh, uh, we did a few collaboration with uh, Michel uh, Slivitsky, uh, mainly sharing data. Uh, Daniel Kaya came a few times in the Saguenay to present uh, global and regional uh, uh, climate modeling. So uh, uh, in 2008, uh, we, we should use information. It was the first use of a climate change scenario. Uh, we, we built a new powerhouse, 225 megawatt. And we use climate projection, very basic method, just to add sensitivity uh, analysis into the, the, the financing uh, mm. finance of the project. In uh, 2010, uh, we, uh, we finally joined uh, Uranus as an affiliate member. We should do more and be more uh, engaged with uh, Uranus. And after that, we did 
uh, few collaboration as uh, the in the project uh, CQ2 and Team Hydrodo Hydro with uh, Robert Lacant at University of Sherbrooke. But one of the major work that have been realized was with uh, uh, Noel uh, Evora to, uh, to do a, a change assessment for various metrics specific to uh, our region and uh, Lake Saint Jean. It was made uh, for the forecast of the future, uh, made for 2050 uh, horizon uh, under a CIMIT uh, three scenario. I would say that in 2016, uh, the, the, let's see again how the future will look alike. Uh, it's, uh, we refresh the study of, uh, of uh, Noel with uh, Grigory Selye, uh, but this time to uh, at the same horizon uh, or focus and with CIMIP 5 scenario. In between, we, uh, we put um, maybe more emphasis, uh, emphasis on the BC uh, territory, uh, but more focus on fish uh, habitat and the impact of uh, uh, collaboration with ENRS, ETS, UNBC, Uranus, and uh, PKIC was also involved in, in some, uh, some part of the project. And in 2022, uh, we realized that we are in the future that uh, it, it takes quite a, a while to be ready to cross the line and to integrate climate change in our daily operation, not only as a portrait of the future. So the, our approach will be the, the subject of uh, Marco and uh, Gabriel uh, presentation. But uh, why now uh, we decided to cross that line? Have we noticed a few a change? The answer is yes. Uh, 13 of our 15 highest winter inflow been observed in the last 25 years. So we can see that it's the, uh, the inflow during the winter. There's a clear, clear signal uh, change, and that's it's consistent with the, the current uh, projection. Uh, also, in the recent past, we had to deal with uh, three uh, significant flooding situations. 2017, 19, and 22, creating a lot of uh, anxiety, stress, and few uh, material damages. Uh, at the opposite, uh, we uh, in the same period we we faced two severe summer droughts, uh, 2010 and 21, and also consistent with projection at some part of the of the summer. So it has a significant impact on our stakeholder uh, surrounding the Lake Saint-Jean uh, for navigation and uh, the, the, the use of the lake itself. <laughs> and sometimes when, when those events happen, we have to face the media or the, the, the communities and to pull out the same poster uh, of the 2050 projection and variability uh, is no longer sufficient. Uh, despite all the difficulties and uh, uncertainty, integrating climate change signal in our day-to-day -day process is the choice uh, the GRI uh, or Rio Tinto team uh, did to ensure uh, a more diligent and I would say efficient uh, uh, operation. So uh, that was my introduction, and I'll let Marco discuss. Hello. You know, so, uh, before presenting our statistical methodology, it's important to give some definitions of what we mean by climate change and natural variability. In common language, climate change is a long term shift in weather conditions identified by changes in temperature, precipitation, winds, and other indicators. Climate change can involve both changes in average conditions and change in variability, including, for example, extreme events. Natural variability usually refers to the fact that even in a climate that is not changing, their weather conditions are changing from year to year. Now, in statistics, when you see changes in average conditions, it means 
changes of the mean of the of a climate variable and changes in variability means a change of the variance of a climate variable. To perform statistical analysis, one needs data that are enough and homogeneous data to have a good estimate of statistics like uh, the mean and the variance of climate variables. Uh, a common approach in climate data analysis is to use like 20 to 30 years horizon periods because using more than that, we observe a certain level of heterogeneity. I will now present our monthly modeling approach and our approach compared to the traditional time horizon approach. First question, why do we proceed with a monthly modeling? First, from a management perspective of large reservoirs, we often have room of space in our reservoir to accept daily or weekly events. Uh, we are more impacted by long-term effects of flood volumes. And second, when aggregating data, we remove the noisy part of the time series and we better then see the signals that we need to, to uh, analyze. Now, what are the main differences from the most traditional approach? With the, the traditional time horizon approach, the natural variability is defined by the variance of the climate variable over a, a zone, like here for us, the, the, red, the red lines. And with the, this traditional time horizon approach, the climate change is supposed to, to change by jumps over those different horizons. In our approach, climate change is is not in terms of modelization a long shift, a long-term shift, but rather uh, the climate is supposed to change slowly with, with time. And for us, the natural variability is no more defined by the variance of the climate variable over a time horizon, but rather by the variance of the uh, regression model for that particular climate variable, if for example, the yellow line. So more specifically, what is our statistical approach? In our approach, we suppose that climate time series may be represented by what is called transstationary processes. In statistical analysis of time series, a, a transstationary process is a stochastic process from which an, under an underlying trend function solely of time can be removed, leaving a stationary process. Here, the trend function does not have to be linear, neither estimated by a parametric model. It can be an smoothing of the, of the trend. And when we remove the trend, based on our definition, what is leaving for us is a time series of what we call the national variable, the natural variability. By our definition of net, uh, stationarity, we use the, what, we, what is called in statistics the weak or white science stationarity. It means that we, we, we are interested, we, the stationarity is only for the first two moments. It means for the mean and the autocorrivariance, including the variance that are, is supposed not to vary with time. When we say stationary, stationarity, that, that means that the time series we suffer is like an independence. It permits cycles like related to indexes like La Nina, El Nino, PDO. Our method is a three-step methodology where at step one, we choose and estimate the trend function of climate variables from climate models. Trend that, uh, Trend analysis of time series is a common task in, uh, in earth science. For example, Budelsi published uh, a review of different methods available to modelize the, the trends. For example, in this article, he presented different parametric models, but it's not necessary to define a parametric model. All non-parametric regression smoothing methods can also be used. We choose from those uh, a simple uh, piecewise linear model to model our trends because it's a simple method and because it was we had good re re results with this model parametric model. 
using a, a piecewise linear models means that at some point in the time horizon, we assume changes in the timing uh, in, at some point in, in, in the trending patterns. For us, since the CMIP-6 climate projections are separated in two parts, uh, the historical, historical one and the projected part from two, uh, beginning in 2015, it was clear that the trends have to be different from and before, before and after 2015. And before 2015, since in our database, we started in 1999 to observe a change in our long-term temperature mean, we decided to modelize the 1950 till 1999 period as if there were no climate change before 1999. So in our modeling approach, we tried different ways of estimating the, the slopes. For us, for example, one slope, two slopes, with and without discontinuities between the periods. At the end, since for the 2000-2014, it was very difficult to see a clear pattern because 15 years is not enough to clearly separate the signal from the natural variability. For that particular period, we decided to aggregate the slope of all climate models to have a better estimate of the signal for that period. But for the 2015 till 2100 period, it was easier to have good estimates of the model's trend. Second part of the second step, to, to be legitimate to use our stationary uh, trans, trans stationary processes, we must validate if the living processes, processes are really stationary. So to do so, first way is to inspect the residuals. So just by, uh, by looking at that, we don't see that uh, from uh, left to right, there's an increase of the variance of the, for the, the green line. So we see that it seems that the variance is not changing over time. More than that, there exists the statistical test to assess the fact if, to know if the, mod, the beta series are really stationary. From those tests, we, we implement uh, two of them, the <coughs> augmented DK4 ADF test and the KPSS test. <coughs> More than that, we since we were in, in, interested to see if there is a, a shift in the variance from the, the CMIP-6 model in the historical part and in the projected part, we use a common Fisher F test of equality of variance to compare the, the CMIP6 data. Uh, we're a small team, so it's how we, we looked at the, the data. It's a, here's a spreadsheet of our results for precipitation. For all models and all periods, the natural variability can be considered stationary with the ADF and the KPSS test in and in only two cases, there was, there was a change in the variance of the variability before and after 2015. For the temperature, we had more cases where we observed a change in the variability, and often the variability was lower after 2015. We also observed that by slightly changing the regression model to obtain the, to, to estimate the trends, for the second spark trend, it was quite easy to overcome these non-stationarity effects. <clears throat> so uh, from those analysis, we conclude that with our definition of natural variability at the monthly time step, and based on the CMIP-6 and projections analysis, for us, we don't see, uh, there is no sign of an increase of the natural variability in the future. I'm now at the last step of our approach. How do we transfer those trends in operation? <laughs> there was a project at Uranos where people initially in the province of Quebec brainstormed to produce a modeling cascade framework to integrate climate data for the creation of future hydrological portraits for all parts of Quebec. Utento was involved in that project. 
Based on that modeling cascade, I will present you our cascade. Our cascade is not an evolution of the former one, but more an adaptation for those who, like us, have a nice database of observations and want to adapt it for climate change modeling. So we first downloaded 19 climate models for two scenarios with uh, Uranus Pavix tools, uh, with Uranus Pavix tools. And at the regional uh, scheme, we do not use climate regional models. At this scale, we use our own database of meteo, which is already in, uh, interpolated at, at a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid. We, we like to use those information also because our hydrological distributed model was calibrated with those particular data. So the, the main part of the methodology is here. From the CMIP6 time series, we estimate climate change signals. And from our observations, we estimate our natural variability. And then we combine them to produce 70 years climate database for any horizon. I'll give you an example of that. From a CMIP6 monthly time series, here, for example, January temperature, we estimate the trend of the, of the time series. We only keep the, this trend and we compare it to our observations in red. From that, we calculate the disturbance that represents for us the natural variability around the trend. We cannot observe here that even if the January temperature was almost the same in 1969 and in 2021, for us, the 2021 disturbance was not, a huge, was not huge for us because the climate has already changed and what was a high temperature record in 1969 is no longer the case and it's almost normal those days. Now to project it at a, a different horizon, like in this year, in 2023, we follow the, the, the yellow line gives us the expected climate level for this year, 2023. And, and from that, we, we take our disturbances and we put them in that particular horizon. Here, it's, uh, here are the results for 2023 and the same for a future horizon. So, what we conserve is like our observation disturbances when we have those data for 12 months for temperature and for precipitation. I also have to add another small step, small, small step the monthly to daily disaggregation because we, we perform monthly analysis. So another time we keep it very simple and we added the temperature signal for all the days of the month. And for the precipitation, we modified it proportionally for each days of the month. We are almost at the end. We feed our hydrological model with the new data. And here's an example of a particular year, 1971, projected at Horizon 2023, this year. We, we, really, we really like the fact that we recognize the original hydrograph of 1971 and of all the years that we've been involved in managing. And in operation, we are also using what is called extended stream flow predict predictions where after a short term prediction, meteor prediction, we add our climatology to produce hydro inflow ensembles. Here's an example of Monday's predictions with and without taking into account the climate change. I will let you, Gabriel, give you more details about that. Hi, so I'm going to present you the application and the adaptation of our water management, especially for the Lac Saint Jean watershed, which represents the downstream part of the total watershed in the river. So we can say that the Rio Tinto water, water versus team, so the GRH, now look to the, to the future by uh, integrating uh, climate change to our water management tool. 
uh, our approach is not uh, perfect, but it's a step uh, in the good uh, direction. So uh, the team now used it uh, for the day-to-day -day operation and also uh, in study mode, like for project. Uh, for example, like uh, the renewal of the decay of the Lac Saint-Jean, uh, which um, uh, we will uh, define the, real, the rules for uh, climate approaching uh, 2040. Or another example is a major uh, rehabilitation project for a centennial uh, power plant in, in oil. So in day-to-day -day operation, the analysts uh, use different tools for operation uh, water management to uh, help, in, uh, help us in the, the decision making, like uh, this short-term uh, simulator. This tool is uh, typically uh, used with forecasts from uh, historical data from 19. Uh, 53 to now, uh, like you can see here. Uh, in order to take into account the climate change in the operational context, we now use it, so uh, this uh, simulator, uh, with forecast with historical data, data added to uh, the climate of uh, 2023 uh, now. So I will show you uh, in this slide the operational example of, of last November. So this, we, this winter, we have a special constraint uh, to, for the Lac Saint-Jean Reservoir to pass below the red block. You can see it. So, uh, the graph is the Lac Saint-Jean Reservoir we know. And we have to pass below the red block uh, for uh, February to March uh, level. So uh, with uh, historical forecast, uh, we don't have any problem to pass below uh, uh, everything was all right. But if we look at the result in the simulation with the forecast with the uh, uh, data added to the climate of 2023, uh, we have some probability to a possibility, a possibility don't respect the constraint. So it's help us to take the decision to stay a uh, maximum generation. And uh, we were right to do it. Because in yellow, we can see the observed level of the Lac Saint-Jean uh, until now. And uh, so uh, we pass below the constraint a few days later, uh, mainly due to the uh, thought of uh, the end of the years. So uh, just for your inf information, the project, uh, the, uh, I don't see that. The, the constraint of the project was for a job, uh, work, a project for a fishing organization. To, uh, they want to do work uh, on the Lac Saint Jean, and it's why we have a constraint for the level. So I forget. <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. for information, the project was postponed from uh, one week, uh, also due to the ice condition uh, with the start of the end of the years, and uh, is currently in progress. So uh, everything is fine. So in day-to-day -day operation, uh, our team are uh, in a transition per period where we use the both set, set of uh, forecasts. Uh, to uh, do the water management. On the other side, we also use the uh, all this climate change train for mid long term uh, management and uh, project. Uh, so we look at the evolution of the climate variable and uh, associate ideology uh, for different horizons. So for a specific project that involves a specific horizon, we can adapt our historical for this period. Uh, this, uh, this analysis is used for different projects and also for an uh, impact to the, uh, on our installation. So I am not going to surprise anyone with this first graph that showed the increase of temperature in the future. So uh, the graph at the left, right, is, uh, is uh, made in the same way as the, the climate portrait of Uranus, but it's our uh, analysis and modelization. So uh, the green line is the observed data from uh, 1953 to now. And for the two SSP, we have the median curve and the 10, 90 percent range. And uh, the blue is for SSP 245, and the red is for SSP 585. At the, uh, the right, we have the annual pattern of the temperature, and the black line is for uh, historical data. So uh, the period where the temperature is below the freezing point historically uh, in our region is like uh, mid-April to November will be uh, reduced. So uh, 
that will lead to a delay of the freezing of the, of the water in the reservoir and a shorter uh, winter period. We also look at the evolution of the precipitation uh, for the Lac Saint-Jean. So uh, we see an increase in uh, amount of precipitation uh, early, yearly, but uh, decrease of the maximum snow cover reach uh, during uh, the winter season. So we will have more precipitation, but as the winter season will be shorter, we'll have less snow, uh, more winter top due to the increase of temperature, and more rain during the winter, and less snow uh, that will be in the spring, the fall of spring. So as a Nordic uh, watershed where hydrology is derived by a snow accumulation and melt, uh, change on this process have a lot of impact on the water management. So if the snow cover is smarter, uh, there is less need to make space in the reservoir to store the melt water uh, during the spring season. After this, uh, we, we uh, model the future hydrology according to the previous uh, climate mm -hmm. model with uh, our model SECO. Uh, Here is the annual mean hydrograph for the lac So uh, the warmer is the color, the more uh, distant is the horizon. So uh, the, uh, the black line is uh, the historical uh, hydrograph. So the key point of the evolution of the hydrograph are the increase of winter inflow, uh, the uh, uh, early spring freshet and the lower summer inflow. Uh, the decrease in the snow cover leads to a decrease in peak flood, flooding and a decrease of the water available in summer. Also, the warmer temperature contributes to reduce the water the availability during the summer uh, despite an increase in precipitation. So if we look at the results for uh, the northern part of our watershed, uh, we see the same train, but with different intensity, uh, especially in the summer fall, where we have less change uh, in the lower. So for the water management of the hydroelectrical, uh, hydroelectric system, our team uses uh, different decision-making tools, such as uh, this uh, reservoir management program based on the stochastic dynamic program programming algorithms. So, uh, we have different tools, it's one of uh, So uh, optimization of this uh, program is made to uh, minimize the known respect of the operational constraint as the minimum, uh, for example, the minimum and maximum level of the Lac saint -Jean. So it's the dash line on the right uh, graph. So uh, we don't want to uh, cross uh, the, the country. So uh, this, graph, this graph shows the historical water management uh, by the reservoir management program. Uh, so it's not what we do in uh, reality, it's uh, what the program simulates uh, when we do it with the historical data. So for the upstream reservoir and for the Lac saint -Jean reservoir. If we provide a future inflow for a specific horizon uh, in the reservoir management program, without changing anything. So without changing the water value function, so we let the historical water value function and let the, the program do what we can with, the, with this. Uh, and optimization will not be optimal because water management is not adapt to uh, this change in hydrology. So here we see that the blue curve is the historical data and the yellow is the future without any adaptation of our program. So in this case, the, the model does not adequately anticipate winter inflow. We, we think we will have less uh, water during uh, winter and we don't know what to do with that. And it failed to reduce uh, sufficiently the reservoir level. It's also poorly anticipate the volume and the timing of the spring freshet, which lead to a difficulty uh, filing the, uh, the, the reservoir. So we think we will have a, a big uh, spring freshet and it's less, so it's not adapt uh, for uh, Climate, climate in hydrogen. So as we can see for the Lac saint Reservoir, in many cases, we have very uh, difficulty to respect the constraint uh, of the minimum level of the Lac saint That is very critical for, like uh, Jean said, uh, all the community of the Lac saint -Jean. 
In order to adapt our operation tool in climate change context, uh, the water value function has been uh, different from the two of the future horizon. So uh, the last slide was without any adaptation, and this one we reconcile the water value function uh, with the future inflow of all the mod uh, climate models. So the purple curve uh, shows the future water management with adaptation according to the quantitative and temporal hydrology change. So uh, this example uh, shows that we cannot longer stay uh, with what was done before. Uh, it's necessary to adapt uh, our decision-making to all our decision-making tool, but also the mindset of the decision-maker as the analyst uh, in order to have a more resilient uh, Water management. So it's the same like you can see here. Uh, without any adaptation, we have difficulty uh, to pass uh, for the minimum level. And with the adaptation of the water value function, uh, the model was able to uh, have a, a resilient water management. So the next two slides will present the change on water management of our two uh, reservoirs for the 2050 horizon. So uh, we want to look at uh, where we are potentially going. So it's just an example for 2050. Uh, first, for the upstream reservoir where the management is more medium turn and uh, have less variability. So uh, the blue is also uh, against the historical. The, the yellow is for two, the SSP 245, and the red one is for SSP 585. So, uh, since the mean winter inflow increase and the peak freshet decrease, the upstream reservoir level is keep higher, and the minimum winter level uh, is higher since the need for, for spring freshet storage uh, decrease. Also, we can uh, see a diminution of the level variability of the, the reservoir because of the flattening of the mean hydro. So here is the result for the lac saint jean reservoir. Uh, we see also the minimum and maximum operation uh, level for by season for this reservoir. So uh, this reservoir, uh, the constraints are very, very more restrictive. So first, we can see an increase of winter inflow and thaw uh, leads to higher and earlier winter minimum level and an earlier spring freshet due to an uh, increase of temperature. Uh, but the volume of water is laminated over a longer per period because of the more water passed uh, during uh, winter, so, uh, which lead to an uh, attenuated spring freshet peak. So for us, uh, the most worrying impact is in summer uh, and beginning of the fall, uh, where there is less water, uh, so uh, which increase uh, of failing below the minimum level according to our current uh, constraint. So if we have more uh, difficulty to uh, let the, the reservoir be uh, in the constraint minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a big challenge that we will try to minimize the impact by uh, adapting uh, our management uh, tool and uh, integrating uh, this problem that we uh, define in uh, our uh, project, like uh, the renewal of the decay uh, that we will do. Uh... So it's an example of 2050, but it's uh, by the, then we will evolve and adapt our. So all this change on the uh, hydrological. Uh, have an uh, impact on the uh, hydroelectric uh, generation. So as the inflow increase and the spring freshet decrease, this water is now produced during winter instead of being spilled uh, in the in spring. So we can see an increase of total uh, system generation. Uh, the lower gain for SSP 585 is explained by a higher ev evapotranspiration, which leads to less water passing through our power. But an, imp an important point is that uh, as the spring freshet is earlier in the summer and beginning of fall, flow decrease, the loop periods are more critical for operating in a constraint and generation, like we see uh, in the slide before. 
So in order to obtain the potential, obtain uh, this uh, generation gain and to reduce uh, the impact, uh, it's necessary to adapt us uh, to, uh, to this uh, ideological change. And the road to that point will have many obstacles uh, as the climate change will have other impact on our watershed and uh, our installation. So there are some of these variables variable that over which we have uh, some control while other we have uh, don't. So to finish, uh, the next step of our technical uh, adaptation for our team is uh, we want to upgrade to have a better representation of the trend function. And also uh, we want to take into account the inflammatory variability to better model uh, extreme fever. Last minute uh, conclusion uh, to, to say that it's not easy to, to cross the line I mentioned before and to do the necessary deployment to integrate climate change into operation. There is always good reason. Uh, we have a high workload, limited resources, uh, other short term priorities. And also, the maybe the main uh, it's the future is always for later. Uh, and also, there's a kind of a little bit of resistance to uh, to modify our historical records. We are very attached to it. We almost, uh, at the time, have a, a hydrological model inside, and we know how the watershed will react for a specific uh, temperature and precipitation event. So, to do away with that data set, uh, we uh, uh, it's a uh, it's, yeah, there, there could be some resistance. Uh, the water and distribution over time is the raw material for energy and constraint compliance. Uh, extreme events are, uh, are definitely an issue that we, we want to, to address more, but climate change is also, uh, it's not always spectacular. And the, uh, to integrate a first step in our daily management, uh, we figure that it just as important uh, our reservoir is continuous and we we have to get prepared from season to season and that's the, the our mindset doing that that first step uh, integration and also the our approach uh, is now flexible and adaptive we know that it's not perfect and it it will never be but it's not a reason to do nothing uh, our approach is, you uh, can say, 80, uh, 20 percent for 80 percent of the benefit for 20 percent effort. We have a very small team, and our advantage is the, the development team doing the operation at the same time. There's a close link uh, between uh, our R&D and operation. And uh, last point is that uh, we have uh, lots of opportunity to try a new approach. Uh, we have a large watershed with a uh, significant challenge. Uh, we have less constraint than public uh, energy producer uh, because we have a, a constant uh, flat load. We're not on the market. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, a small uh, integrated team, and we're definitely looking forward to integrate more climate change science into our operation. We are this afternoon to have a chat. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, Excellent. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, excellent. That 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 was a great uh, presentation. Thank you, Jean, Marco, and Gabriel. Uh, going from a bit of the history of where he came from, setting up a method, and then uh, seeing what that means for Rio Tinto. Um, we do have some time for questions. Are there any questions in the room? Amelie, maybe you can help me because I don't see. Uh, Okay, I have to keep up my microphone here. Um, 
Are there any questions in the room? So uh, my question is about the second part of the presentation about the statistical method. Uh, uh, I like how you apply like classical trend analysis and after that analyze the residual uh, to see if there is any stationarity in that. Uh, but the problem and cannot do anything against that is that you, you need to assume stationarity over like 30 year window. Uh, and after that, you, you, for instance, you compare variability uh, but it's not very large window for ass uh, assessing like significance of variability. And if you want more significance, you get less stationarity over your window. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if he, you uh, considered using another kind of simulation product, product, which is the large single model ensemble, where you have one model, but with different initial condition. Uh, yeah, 50 simulation of the same model with slight difference in the initial condition. So you can assess really well the variability at any day or from 50 different realization of natural variability. And uh, there are a few studies using those ensemble and the other product and showing that there are really a decrease in the variability over different time scale, especially in winter. Uh, which uh, would be related to the decay in the sea ice uh, and also change in the snow cover. So if you have, uh, for instance, uh, in the future, the, in April, the, the zero degree line moving northward. And so you will have a very different climate in terms of coupling between the atmosphere and the surface in a snow covered area related to those snow. So the variability will change. There's like no reason why it wouldn't change, but maybe uh, here it was like a significant change that we were not seeing. So uh, just, I just think that you will really benefit from using this kind of ensemble and without trying to put it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ben, le premier point intéressant, oui, le fait d'avoir, par exemple, 50 scénarios, 50 euh, simulations du même scénario pour euh, améliorer le calcul de, de la tendance et de l'incertitude autour de la tendance, oui, ça serait super intéressant, mais c'est ça, dans les scénarios que j'avais, je n'avais pas de, ben, en tout cas, je n'ai pas trouvé de réplica, là, là, je, je sais qu'il en existe, là, mais je, je les connaissais plus au, modèle, au niveau régional, dans les anciens ensembles, mais nous, on avait des... Il faut dire qu'on a des COVID à faire et aussi qu'on nous impose d'utiliser les CMEPSIS et euh, des scénarios spécifiques. Là. Donc, euh, il faudrait faire attention à qu ce qu'on fait avec ça. Puis par rapport à tous vos autres points, par rapport à, à la variabilité qui, qui est déterminée pour des intervalles de temps, euh, je comprends ce que vous dites, puis là, peut-être qu'on pourrait avoir une discussion ensemble, mais ma définition de la variabilité, c'est plus l'écart autour d'une tendance, ce n'est pas nécessairement la, la moyenne de la variabilité pour une période donnée. Peut-être que si on pourrait en discuter. Hein. C'est un peu la même chose, parce que, oui. mettons, si tu étais dans un climat stationnaire, oui. tu estimes ta variance de température, mettons, sur 50 ans stationnaire. Oui. Ici, ce qu'on propose, l'autre type de simulation, c'est que là, tu vas avoir 50 réalisations pour un même moment. Fait que cette variabilité-là dans le temps et entre les membres de l'ensemble, c'est. Bon, je suis super intéressé. Donc, je vais raconter une discussion de tout ça après. Là. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, maybe, maybe we can, we, we're going to have a discussion this afternoon and maybe we can go into this detail just very quickly. Uh, uh, the, the reply from Marco. Uh, was uh, they haven't looked into uh, large ensembles, which was the question. Uh, but the uh, there are some issues about uh, working with CMIP six uh, large ensembles. CMIP six is maybe may, we're maybe not there. I, I would like to take another question from Chao Sant Anna. Can you hear me? Uh, you raised yes. your hand. Um, a very quick, short question because we have to move on to the next presentation. Also, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Caio Santana. I, I'm a PhD student at Laval University. Uh, my professor is Amarit Tillman. 
Uh, my question is about the water operate uh, the adaptation to the water operation part of your presentation. Um, the water operation system in the literature is, is well is very well offered it's inertia. We can um, hear you in the in the room. Maybe uh, put your question in your chat. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can you cannot hear me. No. Okay. Okay. I will write my question then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right. We have a question in the room uh, from Alain. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so when you do the risk analysis, there's the the probability part, which you're looking at in very much a lot of details. You know, trying not to exceed the two extremes. You know, either too much or not enough. Um, but then on the, extra, the on the risk analysis, there's another axis about the consequences. So you've worked a lot on the probability aspect. Have you worked on the consequences of exceeding those thresholds? Because that's kind of the second part of the risk analysis question, which you have not presented. Yes, in uh, this. Uh, this analysis for more extreme event uh, is is in the in the, the field of the uh, our climate uh, change group, and uh, it's part of the uh, uh, our business unit uh, risk, and uh, it would definitely uh, take action uh, in order to, to to minimize or to do the the, the proper communication uh, with the the, the, the community. So, so does it mean that you actually map the consequences of exceeding thresholds? Yes, of course. we have a, a mapping of a, for different levels of the reservoir uh, the We know how many houses and how many roads are affected. And so we, we have a quite good view. And now uh, for, uh, I would say that uh, the risk of exceeding the uh, decree uh, upper limit is estimated to be a, a one on uh, a 20 year event. But uh, a, now is it a 15 or 10 year event? So we, we, uh, we have the consequences, but now with knowing that the change in the frequency to, to exceed those, uh, those upper limits. So the, the spread of the consequences is the same because we, at the end, we have the CMT. So the only thing that is changing is the, the probabilities that we assess to between those higher levels of the line. Okay. Um, in regard of the time, I'm sorry to have to cut short here um, and skip the questions that are still out there. I would like to move on to our second presentation. So uh, the second presentation, as I mentioned in the beginning, is from Hydro-Quebec, and it's about climate change and Hydro-Quebec, from the adaptation plan to its concrete implementation in projects. And again, I will introduce the two presenters uh, before they go. Uh, the first presenter is Jean-Philippe Martin, who is a geographer with 12 years of prof professional experience in physical geography, climate change, and risk management. He completed his PhD in physical geography on the relationship between climate and weather patterns and the occurrence of high-intensity avalanches. After a postdoctoral fellowship in paleoclimatology and the reconstruction of river temperatures and flows in the Northwest Territories, Jean-Philippe was a consultant and team leader in climate risk and resilience at WSP, and he joined Hydro-Quebec in 2021. As a, sustainable, as a sustainability advisor, he is responsible for the coordination, deployment, and evolution of the company's climate change adaptation plan, with, which appeared a couple of months ago, I think in October. The second presenter is Jan Chavayas, who is a climatologist with nine years of professional experience in climate science and climate change issues. He completed a bachelor's degree in physics and a master's degree in climate science before completing his PhD in climate modeling. He has conducted research in the evolution of climate extremes in Canada on the impacts of climate change on precipitation patterns 
and on the loss of worker productivity during heat waves. After three years as a climate risk and resilience consultant, he joined the Greenhouse Gas and Climate Change Expertise Unit at Hydro-Quebec. In this role, he assists groups in identifying climate change risks and implementing measures to improve the resilience of the energy system in addition to working on the assessment of greenhouse gas emissions from reservoirs and hydroelectric plants. So Jean-Philippe and Jan, are you ready? Do you wanna go take it away? Oh, I'm two people today, so I have a personal problem. Uh, Jan had to, uh, uh, to for paint because he, uh, he was not feeling well today. So uh, I'll okay. be two people today. So uh, uh, as Marcus said, I, I represent more the corporate side of climate change at Hydro Quebec, and, and Jan represents more the technical side. So you're stuck with the schmoozer and not the technical guy. Sorry about that. Uh, so basically, what we wanted to present uh, to you today is is this this idea of working at both levels for a, a big uh, organization like Hydro Quebec. So uh, myself, Jean Philippe, will present uh, the adaptation, corporate adaptation strategy at Hydro Quebec, and myself, Jan, will present afterwards how uh, how we're going to uh, implement uh, the adaptation at the project level, which is far from the corporate level and such a big organization. So this is our general out outline. And without further ado, uh, let's uh, let's go. So. I always say that Hydro Quebec is a climate shop. Uh, we're infrastructure um, uh, owners and operators, and as such, we're really uh, exposed to uh, climate physical risks. Uh, as soon as there is an extreme weather event in Quebec, uh, there is a high likelihood that our uh, operations at some point will be uh, will be impacted. So, uh, and as soon as our uh, operations are impacted. Uh, we uh, directly affect the uh, 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 the quality of life of people with power outages and and, and so so we're uh, always uh, present in, in in the newspaper in that time and 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 so we manage uh, weather and climate we have been managing weather and climate for a long time and as such it's not a surprise that you can see that both sides of climate action are present in our uh, latest strategic plan. So uh, the first uh, orientation or objective of our strategic plan is to uh, is to be a, a, a leader in driving the decarbonization of Quebec. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we have an objective uh, regarding preparing our system, our grid to uh, tomorrow's need. And one of the sub objective is really adapt our practices to make sure that our grid, our energy, uh, uh, generating transportation and distribution systems is is reliable and resilient to uh, future climate or other disturbances. Another challenge about Hydro Quebec is the fact that we're we have a high diversity of assets, high diversity of operations in uh, diverse uh, uh, such a diverse territory. So uh, we're present in northern Quebec, southern Quebec. Uh, in the Boreal Belt or in coastal Quebec, and every every region we have different types of assets. You know, in southern Quebec we have a really dense distribution network, whereas in central Quebec we have our big transmission lines, uh, big reservoirs. So uh, the, the the relationships between different uh, uh, natural hazards or climate hazards and and our uh, activities uh, vary a lot in in across the territory. And this is the diversity that, that we have to consider while trying to uh, make our head about how we should tackle this climate change uh, challenge. And so the first uh, the first part of the presentation, I'm going to present you how we evolved from uh, the onset of thinking about climate change to have a like corporate-wide strategy about climate change and how, how it evolved. And in the second part, we'll see how we aim to implement that at the, uh, at the project level. So climate change three started in 2001. Uh, we prepared, we started thinking about uh, about climate change, but it took quite a long time. And, uh, and this is kind of a, 
uh, complexing after uh, re reading to where they, they show that they've been in action uh, as soon as like as early as 2004, 2006, that we started to be really organized in uh, 2019. And then we implemented our, our climate strategy uh, starting last year. So, but it's been a concern for a long time following uh, the big disasters of the 20th uh, of the end of the 20th uh, century in, in Quebec, uh, namely the ice storm and the stagnant flood, uh, Hydro Quebec started to really uh, be concerned about uh, climate change and uh, co founded uh, Uranus. Uh, so, uh, yay, Hydro Quebec. Uh, <laughs> and, and basically, there was this huge time, uh, 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 time uh, horizon where we had to just, you know acquire knowledge, uh, try to understand, to tackle what is adaptation, uh, what are our challenges, what are the impacts on our uh, on our system. And so the first years with, uh, with an S was about acquiring uh, all this knowledge and implementing first actions. And, and at, at some point, it was realized that, you know, one unit that Ida Quebec had a question and would solicitate either our uh, research center or uh, Uranus to answer that question, whereas the, the another group already asked the same question and, and we need to have like a more coordinated action. And so basically at the end of uh, like around 2017 or, or 2018, uh, there, there was uh, outside pressure from uh, the Canadian Emergency Association, but also internal pressure to you know get yourself organized have like a more cross uh, uh, organizational or transversal approach regarding climate change and 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 deliver a climate adaptation plan. And so it took quite a while. Uh, but for this for this uh, uh, this big uh, uh, phase, which was uh, preparation, I think one of the successes is that we contributed to the development of climate change expertise and knowledge across Quebec. We also use the space to develop our internal expertise and knowledge across Quebec with this partnership between Uranus and our research center, where some of our uh, uh, scientists started to really be involved in climate change, and, and we built our own expertise uh, around that. However, there is this need that I talked about uh, that I talked about for increased coordination uh, to make sure that we gain efficiency and that. You know, knowledge or or, or ideas for action goes through uh, our decision making criteria, and and it allows to trigger action. And so, at the end of the uh, 2010 decade, it was a good time to get organized and have this climate adaptation plan thing going because uh, there was an appetite, a growing appetite for climate change. Uh, when our former CEO went to see the tornadoes and get snow uh, a year after the flooding in in, the, in, in southern Quebec, it kind of started to uh, to be a, 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 a raising concern. While well, it's always a you know a delicate tornadoes climate change, but uh, in the in the uh, in the eye of a CEO, this is something that can uh, uh, it's these kinds of events that can trigger uh, the. Uh, the idea that we need to uh, to act on, on this front. So uh, there was a, a strengthening of links between adaptation and corporate strategies, whether it be uh, uh, this uh, uh, Quebec-wide survey, which was called Energy in uh, Alcamar, where Hydro uh, uh, Quebec uh, consulted uh, many many stakeholders to try to see how we should achieve our, our strategic plan. Our strategic plan and and our uh, sustainable development uh, plan. So basically, there was this this idea that we need to uh, implement adaptation all across our value chain. We need committees to do that. Committees that are more at the decision level and more at the technical level to to uh, uh, to do that. And we have to develop a common framework for adaptation in the, in the different units. It, it cannot be okay. So uh, we're responsible for transportation. We'll do our own stuff and then. And uh, uh, people around generation will do their own, own stuff and operations as well. So we need to have like a common framework to work uh, uh, this uh, this challenge. So the first thing to do was to look at ourselves and 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 do a total risk assessment uh, of uh, of our vulnerabilities. And the so we're in in 2019. Uh, the approach that was 
chosen at the at the moment was to uh, as infrastructure owners and operators look at at our vulnerability to climate change from an infrastructure uh, stance or standpoint so uh we worked with a, a an external uh, consultant who decided to, to go with the 5EC protocol, so the uh, uh, Public Infrastructure Engineering Vulnerability Committee protocol to assess the vulnerabilities. So basically, it's mainly like, you know, a typical risk assessment, uh, but the scope was, uh, uh, was limited to our assets and main activities because we have to start somewhere. Uh, and there was multiple challenging uh, challenges regarding the granularity of a portfolio-wide assessment uh, and versus specific vulnerabilities. For example, the, the the choice was selected to break down our portfolio in 17, uh, 700 components and look at 45 different climate indicators in five different time zones, in three different uh, time horizons for two GHG scenarios. So times, 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 times equals 100 thousands of risk levels. but even despite that level of granularity, we can say, let, let's let's take the idea of a, a substation. Maybe an average for a given region, southern Quebec, our substations are faring really good and do not uh, show any signs of vulnerability to climate change. But that doesn't mean that a specific substation has oil leaks. And, and then when there's uh, extreme uh, precipitation events, there is going to be a, a, a discharge in, in a catchment or or a, a basement that will flood. So even if in in average our assets are faring good, there might be like these specific cases that couldn't be captured in in such a uh, such a, an assessment. So it was still a, a really good uh, activity to do because during this phase. Uh, we developed an active network uh, of, within the organization to maximize buy-in and to start talking about climate change. So there were between 50 and 75 experts, technical experts or, or subject matter experts that were involved in this assessment and, and started to think about climate change. And some of those experts are, are still uh, involved in the process. Some of those experts are even uh, uh, sitting in the room right now. Um, and so, and it allowed to develop a lot of our internal capacity while pursuing our external collaboration with RENAS or other uh, academic uh, partners, partners, or even other utilities as well. Um, but it, it really showed that we need to anchor the adaptation process to the corporate objectives and strategies, because despite of that, when we came with risk assessment results to different groups, they say, well, I need to, uh, to anchor that to our strategic plan of our group, or I have to get the buy-in of higher level uh, before I do anything uh, or, or I act. So there's always this need to anchor uh, our, our, our process to the higher strategic level that, that, that showed. And, 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 and we started to do it, doing that in the, Third phase, uh, which is the implementation of our climate change adaptation plan that was uh, finally published uh, at the end of uh, 2022. You can find it on our uh, website in French and in English for uh, since two weeks ago. Uh, so the good thing is many of our experts were already concerned about the risks that were identified in this, uh, in this plan. So uh, it was easy to implement the first action. So, Getting into uh, uh, getting in, in, into like from assessment to action mode, it, it went pretty smoothly. Uh, so now we're in a phase where we're, we're going to monitor our progress, and 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 we have this uh, this challenge now that the plan was created in our old value chain. You know, Andrew Quebec was organized as you know. Uh, there is a group that's responsible for generating energy and a group that is responsible for transporting energy and a group which is responsible for distributing energy. And now uh, with the strategic plan, we reshuffle the value chain around. We need to you know, uh, have a strategy, then we need to plan, and then we need to have the infrastructures, and then we need to operate these infrastructures. So it, it, it changed the, uh, the mindset, and then we have to adapt the new roles and responsibilities in this new value chain. 
and one question was who is doing what about climate change you know uh, there are what, what what is really interesting is that there are a couple of uh climate change geeks or or, or provide people around different groups uh, i'm personally sitting in the sustainability uh group which is responsible for managing the corporate adaptation strategies uh following the adaptation plan uh i'm responsible uh to uh launch manage cross cross functional initiatives projects that touches the the ensemble of the, the value chain uh there's a group environment where my second me jan is is sitting uh who's responsible for uh, the compliance with different regulatory frameworks such as uh, environmental impact assessments or or uh, or else and they're going to provide the uh, project level risk and uh, climate resilience uh, analysis and they also uh, work closely with the hydrology uh, hydrology expertise group to make sure that to match design criteria this third group expertise and in, uh, in technical support in hydrology and hydrology are working uh, and we're going to talk about that in the second uh, part of the presentation they're working hard to update the, the design criteria uh, for structure make sure that we consider climate change when we uh, define our design or performance criteria uh, they're, uh, they're they're working on a guide to incorporate climate change into design and they work on tailor-made climate scenarios play scenarios ideological scenarios to uh, to make sure that we have the data uh, to, to take this decision about design and finally our research center produce a climate atlas a climate database that we're going to use produce climate information they participate in different uh, innovation research uh, projects and and they align they work closely with the hydrology hydrology group in, in terms of matching data and climate scenarios so there's we have buddies everywhere in the in, in the organization to try to uh, to get this thing moving and in the climate change adaptation plan uh, we identified 26 action areas that were considered priorities uh, for which we uh, identified adaptation measures. And I will not get into listing all of those because we'll be there uh, tonight still and, uh, and you'll be probably asleep. So basically four big categories uh, that we want to uh, tackle. Uh, first of all is design. Uh, want to make sure that we adapt our design uh, for the whole uh, lifespan of our infrastructure to uh, uh, to the constraints that will be brought in by a future climate. Uh, we want to make sure that our operations as well are uh, taking uh, into account climate change. For example, one of our big uh, operation uh, 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 financial uh, uh, aspect is vegetation management. Uh, in the last couple of years, we doubled uh, the budget that is allowed to vegetation management uh, because in a warmer climate, there is an increase in, in, the, in the growth of uh, different species. And with uh, different uh, extreme events, there's also more impacts on this vegetation, which affects then our uh, distribution system. So all the operations as well. We have uh, a category about power outages and impacts on assets during uh, uh, extreme weather events, for example, forest fires. Uh, we conducted a, project, a research project with Uranus and uh, University of uh, Quebec at Rimouski about uh, how uh, uh, return periods of major fires will, uh, will change in, um, in future climate for the western part of the James Bay. Uh, and these results were incorporated in our uh, uh, emergency measures scenarios, uh, catastrophic scenarios about wildfires. So uh, it's, it's going to be implemented in our uh, intervention uh, schemes and our relationship also uh, our, uh, with uh, the subfru, which is the, the uh, fire fighting, uh, wildfire fighting organizations in, in Quebec. And finally, the last uh, uh, action area or, or, or category is everything that touches worker health and safety, whether it be because of uh, more heat waves uh, or uh, other uh, uh, issues such as uh, vector-borne disease, uh, more slips and falls during uh, because of uh, uh, more variable conditions during winter. So basically, for each and every action area, there's a couple 
from one to uh, let's say uh, seven or eight uh, adaptation measures that were uh, uh, identified. I think from uh, today, I, well, I can say that more than 75% of the uh, adaptation measures that are identified in plan are uh, are being are implemented or being implemented. So, and that touches the 26 section areas. So it's it's kind of fun to, to see that we are uh, in action. Uh, and how how is it possible that such a big structure like Air Quebec could, from the time that we had a, an adaptation plan, it took a long time to get to an adaptation plan, but to get into action, it went really smoothly because uh, the staff were already aware and committed to take action. Uh, the, the climate adaptation plan was built with a, a, a really strong governance mechanisms, I think, with committees that represented the whole valley chain, uh, committees that were uh, at a level of decision that they could, uh, they could raise flag or talk to the higher uh, uh, level of the, uh, uh, of the organization, but at the same time that were in contact with the technical staff that could feed them. So this, this governance mechanism uh, helped to, uh, uh, to get into action, but uh, there's still a need to provide frameworks to consider climate change across all our activities. Uh, usually, especially at the design uh, level, uh, some the design team say, yeah, we want to in integrate climate change, but we need to have like a, a strong uh, framework uh, and, uh, and dire, uh, direction from, uh, from the high level to say it has to be taken account in the projects at that moment. Uh, and the plan can be improved and aligned, like I said, with our new value chain. So in the climate uh, adaptation plan, uh, there we, we identified also three, uh, we could say cross-functional uh, 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 action area uh, that need to be uh, uh, tackled as well to get to our objective, to make sure that climate adaptation is considered in all activities at Hydro Quebec. So it starts with education, training, uh, uh, foster collaborations with our internal and external uh, stakeholders. It, it's to, to pursue the implementation of a, a research and expertise development program in collaboration with university chairs and collaboration with, uh, with RENAS as well. Um, it's also, we have to make sure that, you know, there's in our policies, uh, in, our, uh, uh, in our guidelines, that there are climate change commitments as well. It's not just in the plan, but everywhere in, in our policies in, within the organization. And soon enough, we'll have to, uh, to you know, uh, get back to the round table, adjust our plan, adapting, uh, adapting it to the new value chain and making sure that all the, the dead angles that we had in this first iteration, or not, not all, but most, let's say, uh, will be considered as well to make sure that we uh, uh, go for, uh, forward. And, you know, this work that we do uh, uh, on climate change, at Hydro Quebec is uh, is only possible because of the long-standing relationship between our research center and Uranus and other uh, academic partners. Uh, and this is a couple of projects that we worked on, or that we are are working on, or that we will work on uh, with uh, uh, with these partners. So. For example, I already talked about the wildfire project in the James Bay region. Uh, there was a, 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 a work that was done on freezing rain recently as well uh, across Quebec. Uh, there is an NSERC uh, project that is on the, uh, that might uh, uh, start uh, soon enough. I don't have the last, uh, uh, the, the last news about that, about extreme wind and uh, extreme precipitation. And we are developing a project in terms of with awareness in terms of uh, how do you how do we integrate climate change in our economic analysis at different scales at Hydro Quebec. So it's an evolving process, as I mentioned. Uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of things that we have to work on to get better, trigger uh, adaptation uh, even more. So whether it be prioritized action uh, areas and adaptation measures, so there's a lot of those. 
and there's a appetite from the uh, 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 direction of Hydro-Quebec to, to say, well, where should we put our efforts first? Uh, efforts first. Uh, that's a tongue twister. Uh, all the question about assessing the financial impact of climate change for uh, the organization, uh, developing adaptation metrics to measure our success or the adaptation measures that we are uh, implementing. Do we have the success, success uh, uh, that we uh, we expect? Uh, we have to develop partnerships with communities for climate action as well. Um, we need uh, a lot of external partnerships to implement these climate uh, these, these changes. For example, the municipal uh, uh, communities and uh, municipal communities need oh sorry about that uh, need our uh, uh, our support as well to build their resilience. So we have to develop those partnerships. And there's a lot of other activities that were not considered in uh, in this first iteration of climate uh, uh, of our climate adaptation plan that we have to consider everything that touches our environmental activities. Do we we'll have more, you know, uh, contaminated soil management to do in a changing climate? Uh, will we be able to affect the different decrees or uh, uh, or uh, um, uh, our account, uh, that we have with the uh, uh, with the communities, uh, our our supply chains resilient. Can our suppliers provide us with the equipment we need to build our resilience? Uh, can we integrate uh, climate change in our ad asset management processes? And there's an appetite from the direction direction to have a TCFD task force on, on climate financial disclosure uh, reporting as well. So this was for the corporate part. So now I can go switch lens and go at the, the project level. So how do we uh, uh, how do we hope to implement action adaptation uh, at that level? So from the corporate to uh, the project level. So in the adaptation plan, there are six action areas that directly uh, uh, affect uh, uh, the design uh, of our infrastructure. So there. Are, uh, they're, they're there. I will not uh, read everything that's on the slide, but basically from adjusting the design standards, making sure that we maintain an appropriate discharge capacity in a, uh, in a changing climate, uh, that we increase the resilience of control structures, retaining structures, every structures, basically, uh, that we adapt our construction practices to new climate situation, or uh, that we make sure that we prevent uh, flooding upstream, uh, upstream and downstream of generating stations in our operations. So basically, uh, there's a lot of action areas to implement that will uh, affect projects. Uh, and there are three categories of actions that uh, are pretty umbrella to these six uh, areas and that will affect, uh, that will have, a, 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 let's say, a profound effect on, on our adaptations, or this is how, how we feel. Uh, so. First of all, is try to make sure that we have a, a high level climate resilience uh, assessment of every project. So conduct climate change resilience assessments for targeted facilities, whether it be uh, during refurbishment or new projects. Uh, it's improve access uh, to climate data and always work to get, you know, more uh, targeted climate data to our uh, operational or, or design needs. And we're working to facilitate standardized use of hydrological and climate projection using data portals across uh, uh, Hydro-Quebec. And basically, it's working on updating our design criteria in the first, the first uh, step to get to that is to establish a reference framework to defining uh, um, these hydroclimatic criteria uh, for facilities in, in light of climate change. So basically, when we go to the uh, principles from Engineer Canada, there are a couple of principles that uh, that you know uh, uh, should make it a, a part of uh, the, the 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 professional uh, responsibility of engineers to consider climate change because they have to plan for the whole lifespan of the uh, of the infrastructure. They have to uh, apply a principle of risk management to uh, to take into account uncertainties when they uh, uh, in their design. So basically, there are these principles that are really easily translatable uh, to what we do in climate adaptation. And there are also uh, 
increasing regulatory frameworks about uh, considering resilience in uh, infrastructure projects, whether it be through uh, environmental impact assessments, uh, where uh, they require this uh, evaluation as well at the federal and provincial level. Uh, there are also green uh, grant programs such as uh, ICIP invest investing uh, in Canada uh, infrastructure program uh, from uh, Infrastructure Canada. Uh, so when there are um, projects that are uh, submitted from a, uh, over a certain uh, threshold of, of, of importance, uh, the, uh, these projects need to have a resilience uh, assessment as well included to, uh, to the grant application. And uh, the International Hydro Power Association has this new standard, which is uh, the Hydro Power Sustainability Standard. Uh, and to have your uh, facilities uh, uh, certified by this standard, uh, you need a resilience as one of the requirements. So there are frameworks that are, are, are getting there to uh, trigger change. And, and you know, I'm, I'm preaching to, uh, to, to a crowd that already know that, but there are additional benefits for project. And this is what we have to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, raise awareness about in our, um, in our teams in Hydro-Quebec. You know, if you include adaptation in your project, you're going to increase safety, uh, flexibility, efficiency, uh, uh, cost, uh, you'll make sure to, uh, to stay uh, uh, compliant with the evolving regulatory frameworks. Uh, you'll make sure that you, know, you ensure functionality of your structure until the end of design life. And it's gonna be good for uh, the reputation of the organizations as well. So uh, this is uh, the benefits that we have to uh, raise awareness on uh, for sure. And basically, uh, when a project triggers uh, environmental impact assessments, we have to go through uh, a climate trends analysis, which is, you know, fairly standard. So what we do is, you know, we try to define our context, our boundary of our assessment, select the climate hazards that we're going to look at, the infrastructure components that we're going to look at, and then identify the interactions between said components and uh, and the climate hazards, and then do a risk assessment like a probable uh, uh, likelihood times consequence uh, uh, or, or severity of consequence uh, assessment. And then from these uh, this risk assessment to comply to uh, the uh, environmental impact assessment frameworks, we have to implement control and adaptation measures. So basically this, uh, this regulatory uh, requirement will trigger adaptation in the infrastructure uh, realm. But to do that for our design team to be able to do that, they need to have the tools to, uh, to think about climate change. So Hydro-Quebec is right now uh, building in its own climate atlas, yet another climate atlas, because there's not enough of those right now. Uh, but the difference is we need to have one with indicators climate indicators that are computed uh, related to our needs. So basically, I, I, uh, let's say for a, a, a transmission line, maybe the, uh, the, the design criteria should be around days uh, where temperatures exceed 35 degrees. And we need to have this specific indicator in our, uh, in our um, climate atlas. So targeted indicators and also on our uh, our climate I mean, atlas, we'll be able to overlay our infrastructure uh, uh, map with the climate indicators. So if you're working on a substation or on a on a transmission line, uh, you're going to be able really to uh, to to get the data for the specific location as well. Uh, we are in parallel of the development of the atlas, which is developing a training, a mandatory training to use this atlas. So basically. Everybody that will go and click and 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 uh, get information from this uh, uh, this database will have at least some yeah forty minutes but at least some training about you know what are uh, what is climate data uh, how it is organized and you know get data from more than one scenario choose your uh, your uh, time horizon wisely uh, yada 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 
it should be ready uh, ready this year uh, by Q4, hopefully. Uh, and so this is for the atmospheric variable. At the same time, Ayurkovic is working on his hydrological uh, database as well. Uh, basically, the idea is to produce uh, hydrological projections in a changing climate based on SMIP 5 and 6. Uh, and the end game is to uh, integrate climate change projections in design, dam, dam safety assessments, planning, operations, uh, and etc. So basically, this is the other part of getting uh, the data ready to, uh, uh, to uh, for, for our design team to think about climate change. But even if we have the data, we need to have uh, provide also recommendations on how to integrate that uh, for uh, for dam security or other um, other infrastructure project. And this is. Uh, a guidebook that uh, Elise, who is sitting here, has been working on for the last, I don't know how many months, but basically it's uh, it's kind of a, a, a guidebook that, that that is designed in a, in a, this little uh, flow chart or, 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 uh, or a decisional star chart. So basically, are your components designed to consider uh, winter and climate? If yes, look at your time horizon. Is it long enough that uh that you need to uh think about climate sh change if if yes when should we think about climate change as soon as possible in projects and then how is uh is uh is the next step so how do you uh integrate climate change so what data do you use what level of effort do you include uh depending on the on the uh, on the on the project so basically this is the first uh the first gate uh, is like a higher level, and then there's a break point. And if you have to go, uh, you, you go through uh, like more uh, in-depth analysis uh, until the end, you have a couple of good uh, best practices that, that is there. Anything that you want to add to this, please? No? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to take uh, the, the credit for that, it's all hers. Uh, so this is this. So basically, this guide. Uh, the objective is to provide a step-by-step -step approach to determine uh, design criteria uh, of first of all hydraulic communities in the context of climate change, uh, because we have to start somewhere. And uh, and the, the, the logical thing to do was to start with hydraulic communities uh, in the, the first version. And the next version could consider other hydroclimatic hazards and be able to be transferable to other uh, type of infrastructures. Um, and it's really interesting because the guide is for engineers, uh, but it really encourages uh, uh, you know, best practices, whether it be you know, multidisciplinary, uh, disciplinary, you, you have to work with climate experts and in, in, in defining your design criteria. Uh, you, you have to make informed decisions uh, based on, uh, on every uh, piece of information you get. And, it, the step-by-step the -step approach is really easy to follow, but yet uh, really goes in great detail about the complexities of, uh, of every step. Uh, so, and what is really interesting, uh, interesting about this guide is that Elise really worked in collaboration with employees of her group, Hydraulic and Hydrology, but other, uh, uh, other units at, uh, either within Hydro Quebec, but also other uh, the subject matter experts, some of, uh, of them from Uranus, to uh, to make sure that we follow state of the art uh, uh, practices. So, what Jan wanted to say about that slide? <laughs> so, it's a good The guide basically we. We explain how we did, how we're supposed to do risk management, and because because it's in some uh, teams it's not so clear because law the, the engineers follow the law they they're they're like exposed to, so sometimes it's not uh, so much easy for them to take a step back and think about adaptation. So it's a bit what we're doing in the guide to explain each step, and uh, so basically. Uh, the hazard, it's not clear, it's not always clear for engineers that the hazard part is uh, what you compute, but that you take a, a decision on the capacity term, it, and it, that's the decision that the engineer is taking, uh, knowing the rest of the equations. In the guide, we're going through this equation, 
keeping in mind that uh, the performance criteria at the bottom of the slide. You saved me. So that's <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, so to uh, continue, I'm going to use, uh, I don't know if my float is, is online, I'm going to use her analogy, I think. Uh, and I, it's cruel to do that at, just before lunch, but uh, I think the great thing about how we work at Ayur Quebec is we work in a sandwich. Uh, so uh, basically, we try to tackle climate change at the corporate level, work on policies, guidelines at the, the, the strategic level. But at the same time, we have a core of uh, highly uh, skilled technical people who are trying to uh, implement concrete, uh, more you know, ground to earth or down to earth uh, uh, processes to make sure that it's taken into account. And you know, in the ham between these two bread uh, or, or the tofu spread uh, is uh, is the fact that you know uh, we're trying to to carry all all the organization uh, in between this sandwich. So basically, we have this top down approach about uh, to propel climate adaptation, uh, getting buy in rep from representatives of the complete value chain. And there's also this bottom up approach, mitigate risk at the project level uh, by raising awareness about the the importance of capturing uh, the benefits of integrating adaptation, improve climate resilience projects, preparing tools to assist our team. And I think that the adaptation success, success I've been working with a lot of organizations and sometimes the strategic level and the technical uh, level uh, don't speak uh, much to each other. Whereas uh, we make sure that there's like a, a really strict coherence between those two levels of change to make sure that we can trigger that that change. So basically this is it for, uh, for my part. Great, uh, thank you Jean-Philippe. Um, I think you did a great job at uh, imitating Jan also. That, uh, <laughs> and thank you Elise for jumping in. Um, Maybe I'll just pass over to uh, Amelie real quick to look for questions in the room. Oh, this is me. <laughs> Any yes, questions uh, in the room? Yeah, um, thanks for the presentation. That's good. Uh, how do you assess more like human level, human scale risks, such as like uh, increased risks of water conflicts or uh, changing of energy needs due to climate migrants or things like that, where like, it's really hard to associate the data to it, but it's like a really, I don't know, it seems like it might be a big risk in, in, a, in uh, a couple of decades. Yeah, well, these are, uh, I'd say these are part of the dead angles that we want to, uh, 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 that we want to really cover in the next iterations of the plan. Uh, we have for sure a group that is responsible at Air Quebec for you know integrated risk management, and when we're going to try to tackle those risks, you know uh, everything that is you know they're uh, used to work uh, on on the risks at that level, you know where you don't necessarily have like a strict data. Uh, they work on you know, everything that is geopolitical or or whatnot. So so I'd say that this is kind of a blurry response, but uh, I the, the the solution will be to uh, just. Uh, you know, knock to their door, and it, it goes back to co coherence that I was talking about, and make sure you know, okay, there's you know climate change pressure on these aspects. You know, how would you uh, integrate that in your risk management framework for 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 the organization, and try to uh, and try to uh, to go from there? And so they'll probably have like tools uh, that that are more aligned to, to those kind of uh, uh, of assessments, and then. Uh, it's always the same thing. We have to anchor it with the un business units that will be mostly affected in either uh, affected by or in managing those, those risks and, and try to find mm -hmm. the, the good the good people to uh, to make sure that our assessment is aligned with their risk tolerance and then that they have uh, all the information that they need to to take action. I don't know if that answers the question. It's kind of yeah. a political response that I gave. So it's, it's not there yet, but it's on the table. Exactly, it's on the table, not there yet at all. 
So I've been working with you guys for a long time, and I, I kind of had a feeling that a lot of the focus so far for adaptation has been on the generation side. And yet the public is most exposed to the distribution distribution side. So is, is that a fair assessment that more effort has been put to generation or it's by bias or? I'd say like in, in terms of, uh, no, it's, it's not your bias. I think, especially in terms of knowledge acquisition, uh, a lot of effort was made on the hydrology, uh, hydrology side for, for a long time. Uh, whereas on the distribution side or you know the, the power outage uh, side of things, it's you know there the teams are, are are responding to extreme weather events, whether you know and and whether it's climate attributed to climate change or not, they have to respond as well. And this is funny because uh, I had a, a chat a couple of, of weeks ago that we want to start to uh, instead, because the thing is, I don't go back to the big organization, there's a lot of silos. Uh, there was the, the silo of, you know, generation, transmission and distribution. We took those silos and we, 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 we put them horizontally. So now we have levels. Uh, so, <laughs> so, but uh, basically on the, on the, the power out, the, we want to start these workshops saying, okay, well, there's this power outage issue with Hydro Quebec, you know, and what do we, what do we need in the value chain to make it better? So basically we need data from our research center to know, well, how it's going to change uh, uh, frequency, intensity, uh, you know, spatial uh, configuration about these changes. And then we need to know how we have to make our, uh, our evolve our grid and then how we have to, in this evolution, change our design, and then how these changes will affect operations, and try to to think it more and more of a system instead of thinking like you know what we usually do when we do a first risk assessment is okay, we think about boxes and not like the, the system level, and and we want to, we want to change that indeed to to take it more in a like holistic approach to a or a systemic approach to a, to the issue, which is you know. People at the end of the line in December this year didn't have power at Christmas, and and that was you know uh, not not a failure, but you know a, 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 a situation that everybody wants to avoid, basically. Maybe Narco uh, online in the chat. Yes, there is actually a question that uh, Charles Balenfant asks um i i'll just uh, pass it on it's a question whether the guide you presented at the end will be available publicly at some point or if that's going to be more of an internal Marco. document Marco, on top of uh, I'll try again like this. Um, the question from Charles Malenfant was uh, whether the guide you presented at the end was going to be publicly available at some point or if that's an internal document. So I'm going to transfer the question to Elise with the, the objective there. Uh, so we don't know yet. I built it so that it can be shared. Uh, and I really hope it's going to be shared. But um, uh, we're going to see if there is an appetite outside to push it because uh, it, 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 it's a lot of effort for us to push it outside of the organization. So if you make demands, maybe I'll have time to uh, to work on that <laughs> and translate it and uh, share it. But I, I guess uh, one of the, the easiest way is going to be through uh, organizations like iCold or the CDA or uh, things like yeah. that. CID or uh, yeah, it should get there. Well, I want to talk to you about this anyway, also. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see any more questions online. Are there any more questions in the room? Just to piggyback on what David was saying. So, um, and you mentioned it being the electrification process, right? And now, in theory, in you know, 20 years, there's going to be a lot more electrical cars, for example. So that's can be a problem because you have you're going to have a lot more demand from new users, right? But but in theory, it should be an opportunity also to tackle some of the problems. For example, you have cars that have batteries, so in theory, you can use these batteries to smooth out the peak events or power outages, right? So is this like 
things that you guys think about and, and try to come up with, well, yeah, forecast for this demand and then try to think of innovation where you can actually make use of these. There's a, there, there's a, a group at Daru Quebec, it's the Midlands, and they're with me, it's going to be a corporate name, I'm sure. What is it in, in English? Uh, like integrated design and evolution of the grid, basically. So there is this group who's responsible for trying to think about those uh, uh, innovative uh, solutions. And I meet with them in a couple of, of weeks to, uh, to try to, uh, to bridge climate adaptation to their activities. But for sure, this is something that uh, I know they've been working on uh, the idea of having like the, the like yeah car batteries as you know a, a backup source to flatten the uh, uh, the peaks or or to uh, or or to uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, limit uh, the impacts of outages. This is something that has been uh, uh, discussed internally. But where where is it? Uh, it it's really funny because in the old in the old hydro Quebec, you know, our, our, our distribution representatives from uh, on the adaptation committees were far from these innovation teams. So basically, this is something that was not necessarily part of of the of the the concerns that were raised or the ideas that were raised in the adaptation committee. Whereas in this new hydro, we have the same players, but we have a different position in the organization where they're really closer to this uh, evolution, like integrated evolution of the uh, of the grid, whereas it's going to be uh, uh, probably helping us to make sure that we uh, we get some good uh, relationship with, with those stakeholders and really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, with regards to the PIEVC assessments, um, were there specific issues in trying to find the right hazards or right um, the right climate variables uh, to to put in the assessment? No, because I, I was not at Hydro Quebec, but I think because uh, they uh, they failed to use the parsimony uh, principle. Uh, so basically, like in, in if we don't know what's the real threshold, we're going to use a couple, uh, for example, and then uh, see how the likelihood evolves. So basically, that was the uh, the approach, and and this resulted in a super heavy assessment that was not maybe as informative as it could have been, and it resulted in a an assessment that took way longer than uh, than it was supposed to. So basically, uh, I. I think there, well, yes, there was a challenge was to select the right one. And I think this is uh, for having conducted a couple of IVCs uh, myself in my former life. I think this is really hard for, for people to really select like a single threshold to represent like the, 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 the array of possible failure level of a specific component. So it's, a, it's always the same issue. And I'm sure they had the same at the internally when they did it. Marco, uh, okay. question in the room. Uh, yeah, well, I guess um, I guess we can wrap it up here. Um, thank you again to all the presenters today. I think this was really interesting and inspiring. Um, the recordings of the seminars are going to be available on the website in a short while. So again, thank you all for joining. And... Uh, See you at the next seminar.